thanks for uh, Dairy Australia for inviting me today to talk to you about um, or present the Australian Health Survey results um, on this on this really interesting and, and important important topic. There's a lot of data available from the the AHS, so what I'm going to present to you is really a, uh, a, a snapshot. It's um, it's a it's a selected highlights if you like. Um, but there's obviously a lot more that people could focus on to really um, explore, explore the issue in great detail. I'll be looking at um, uh, different age groups. Generally I want to be looking at 14 to 18 years because that's the, the age group which the um, NHMRC use in recommendations and guidelines but um, in a few other places depending on the topic um, being looked at there's other age groups um, being used. Okay, so what we're looking at here is the population pyramid for 2011-12, and this is just to show you the you know, setting setting some context for the um, for the population we're looking at here. The 14 to 18 year olds are making up uh, 1.4 million people in the population, and uh, and the, much like any other cohort, the ones above them are a little bit bigger because that's where um, we see overseas migrants coming in and bolstering the population. This is jumping forward to. Um, 30 years to 2041-42, and that's just showing these uh, 14 to 18 year olds, once they hit, um, I guess, the early parts of middle age, 45 to 49 they'll be. And, um, and, and the point of this is to say, well, population projections um, incorporate mortality rates, and that, they, those tell us that 99% um, of females who make it to 18 will survive to age 45. 97% of the males will make it to that age. So the issue of uh, here is not, of course, survival. It's about what will be the state of health once people make it to in, into middle age, and that very much is determined by um, by the risk factors that people are exposed to, um, particularly lifestyle risk factors, um, you know, smoking, um, uh, exercise, and and diet. And and uh, it's arguable that diet's the most um, amenable to to improvement or to, to giving the, the most uh, improvements in lifestyle, in, in, health, in health outcomes. But first I just want to look at overall health of the population and show how the uh, 15 to 18 year olds here can compare with the rest of the population in general health and, and not surprisingly they're, they're, they're generally healthier. They say that uh, about two thirds have uh, excellent or very good health um, and that's on a scale that includes just um, good, fair and poor. And that corresponds um, very well with this next graph, which shows the number of health conditions, the average number of health, long-term health conditions that people would have in their particular age group. So 14 to 18 year olds will have around one on average, and uh, in each successive older age group, people are um, accumulating uh, these long-term chronic conditions. And you might even think that one sounds like um, quite a lot, given that that list on, on the right looks like it's, it's fairly, um, it's fairly serious, but the, the 14 to 18 year olds who are reporting uh, conditions are generally, it's more on the more mild and manager end, manageable end of the scale. So it's things like um, uh, um, hay fever and asthma and sinusitis uh, and short sightedness of the leading ones. So the, the good news with the 15 to 17 year olds continues in this slide. So. The smoking rates show that only 6% of uh, the, uh, the, the young adults are smoking and that's uh, it's been declining over the last few decades. And, and similarly in older age groups we've got more ex-smokers now than current smokers. And the fact that we've got so, so few uh, smokers in their teens means that in the future we'll have um, less adult smokers. So, that smoking story was a win for, um, for public health, but not so for um, overweight and obesity, where we see this uh, increase, virtually a doubling in the rate amongst the, uh, the 12 to 17 year old uh, population between the 95 and 2011-12. Yeah, so about a quarter of, just over a quarter of males and a quarter of females uh, have a BMI um, that's uh, considered overweight or obese. And this is a, a, a cross-section of the population um, height in 2011-12, uh, 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 and it just shows that um, 
um, the obvious point that people's height's fixed once they get to between 16 and 18. Um, and when it comes to weight, that's certainly not the case. People can still keep putting on weight well into their middle age. And, uh, and that's the case for people who, who go into, into their 20s, even um, who, are, who are a normal body mass index. So, and, and, and we know that people who have a um, higher, who are of a higher BMI, or who are overweight or obese, as adolescents are more likely to be overweight and obese as, as, um, as adults. So, so it's a worry that we have a, a quarter of the population um, in that category. So just moving to the physical activity. First, I just want to show the results from the 11-12 survey when we asked about um, time spent in front of a screen. And this is sort of leisure time with uh, TV, uh, video games, and, uh, and computing. And this is, ex this is yeah, leisure time excluding um, schoolwork and, and homework. So around three hours a day on average for 15 to 17 year olds. So that exceeds the, the recommendation of two hours. And when you look at the level of physical activity, sort of declining commensurately with it, and that one hour a day you're seeing for 15 and 17 year olds, that's one hour per day every week. And that, looks, that doesn't sound too bad, uh, except when you consider that within the 15 and 17 population, there's a whole lot of, uh, of, of individuals who aren't getting nearly enough, probably 30% or actually 25% aren't doing an hour a day on even one day out of the last seven when we surveyed them, and another 30% were we're probably doing a maximum of two days out of the last seven, are getting, getting that hour a day. So this um, was a media release that we went with um, way back uh, last year when we released the first results of the nutrition survey. And um, we unashamedly um, picked on the youth um, with his headline about soft drinks, burgers, and, and chips, um, because for us it just seemed um, the, I guess overall the the thing that stood out was how poor relative to everyone else's um, diets were, were those of uh, of young people, and so we're seeing relatively less consumption in the healthier core food groups, particularly uh, vegetables and uh, fruit and and the dairy group there and. A relatively more consumption in the in discretionary foods, the, the energy dense and, and nutrient poor choices, and that's um, highlighted by the by the proportion of energy coming from discretionary foods, over 40 percent for the 14 to 18 year olds, and the leading foods for uh, providing energy from discretionary sources were uh, soft drinks and uh, cakes and muffins, and I thought that was interesting the the sex difference in those two those two um, for the males and females there. And then it's followed by the takeaway um, foods such as um, chips and, and mixed dishes, which is mainly burgers uh, when it comes to discretionary foods, and the pastries, which includes um, pies and sausage rolls. Um, and then it's chocolate biscuits and ice cream. And then at the bottom, I've put the uh, alcoholic beverages in. Um, it's just to show that it's only around 1% overall of discretionary energy, which is um, which is good, but in, in contrast for um, adults, that would be around 17 percent. So, uh, um, on the day before interview, almost a quarter of uh, the males in a 14 to 18 group would, were consuming burgers. Most of these were with a fast food type of burgers. and a similar sort of age pattern for the consumption of soft drink. Half of um, males were consuming a soft drink on the day before interview, and about 38% uh, of, the, of the females. On top of that, there was another 7% who were consuming energy drinks, so they're not considered in the same, in the same category in the classification, so. Fruit um, consumption has this um, pattern. Uh, this showing that the day before uh, interview, uh, only 45% of males were consuming fruit, maybe 52% of females. It doesn't actually improve until people get into, into their 30s. And uh, just with the last two um, slides in mind, this just shows the contrast of where people are getting um, sugar from and when we're comparing soft drink and fruit. So along, amongst the, the males, 22% um, was coming from their soft drinks. 
um, compared to 10 percent for everyone else and now only getting nine percent from from the fruit compared to 16 percent for everyone else so vegetable consumption was um, was quite low the day before day before interview only around half of males and 57% um, of females were consuming uh, vegetables and uh, we asked people a separate question around how many serves on average they would get on the usual basis for vegetables and it was around two serves per day was reported by, by males and females in age group and that compares with the, the recommendation of uh, five and a half for males and five for, for females so uh, well short on vegetables and that's um, but it's all, it, it, to be fair, it's, um, it's across the population as well, but, but this population is, is worse. So milk, cheese and yoghurt, it looks like um, um, not too bad if you've got 80% of people consuming in that, in that age group, but the, the problem is they're getting, uh, they aren't getting enough, and this is um, looking at the total serves of dairy um, for males and females, and we're estimating around 1.3 serves of dairy being consumed a day for the males, 1.1 for the females, and that's against the recommendations of uh, three and a half serves for each. So probably only around a, a third as much as, as recommended, or just over a third and under a third for the males and females. And that corresponds then, or translates into calcium intakes that you can see on average that are well below the estimated average requirement for calcium. The EAR is um, set as a uh, level at which, um, below which um, the population uh, we should be considered at risk of, of deficiency. Um, so on average, we're getting, we're getting less than the EAR and a separate way of analysing this is using usual intake analysis and applying a, a cut point to that and seeing who on a regular basis would get less than, than 10, 50 milligrams. And uh, that was 70% uh, of males and around 90% of females on, um, on a usual basis wouldn't be getting enough calcium. And uh, iron looks, doesn't look as bad, um, um, particularly the males and the females average was above, but on a usual basis, uh, around 40% of females weren't getting enough um, iron according to, the, um, according to the AAR. And there are a few other micronutrients where um, females were possibly a bit marginal and thiamine was about 11% and uh, folate was 8% below the AAR. And finally, um, I'll show you the sodium, which is uh, obviously a, a mineral which we need to limit in, in order to reduce our risk of, uh, of, of hypertension. So the upper level is 2,300 milligrams, and males, 14 to 18 year old, old males, had the highest um, consumption of sodium across all age, age groups in the population. And uh, about 90% would be exceeding that, that upper level on a, every day, and around half of the females will be exceeding it every day. So there's a, there's a snapshot and, um, <laughs> okay. And, and um, I think, the, I think the, the summary would be there's um, lots of room for improvement.